Hey, Mitch Gray, welcome back. Of course, my name is Dr. Keith McNally, and you are on the Question Guy podcast. Of course, these are special editions because we are going through your book. And once again, where is it at? How to Hire and Keep Great People. There, I could center on the camera. So we're in chapter nine, and we're about midway through the book, and so that's really good. And chapter nine is titled this, Defining Who to Hire, Understanding the Art of Hiring. So this is where you kind of go into the heart and soul of the book. On the back end of the chapter, there are six questions, and I want to read them. I want to do this a little bit differently this time, because they all focus on the same thing. And I really want to kind of get your whole take on what's going on here. So if you let me, let me go ahead and ask all six questions. Don't answer any of them up front, because we want to talk about this. Do it. So question number one reads, do you know who you need to hire and why you need to hire them? Question number two is multiple choice. Which do you currently value more? Skill set or character? Experience or work ethic? Past jobs or energy? And degrees or creativity? So I think there's like there are dichotomies in mm -hmm. each of those, mm -hmm. in each of those right. um, A, B, C, D. Question number three reads, who does the interviewing within your organization? Where did they learn how to interview? And that's an interesting question. Um, Cause I, could you go to school for that? <laughs> I don't remember that being part of my, my college <laughs> career. Um, right. It's like balancing a checkbook. Did you go to school for that? I'm serious though. Uh, what questions do they ask? And when do you review your interview process last? Or when mm -hmm. did you? review your interview process last. Question number four is this unique question. On a scale of one to 10, a Likert scale, on a scale of one to 10, how do you value your process for interviewing? Hmm. Hmm. Number five, does the person or team holding interviews understand how to convert an interviewee into a fan or supporter? And Based on our conversations now, eight chapters in, this being the ninth chapter, I'm thinking that that answer is, you know, very few if they really understand mm. how to convert an interviewee into a, an organizational support. Yeah. Number six, take some time painting the picture. And this is, you know, and we've talked about this in other places. I love this, this question. Take some time painting the picture of who you want on your team, hobbies, what hobbies do they have? Where do they hang out? What books do they read? What are they involved in? Things of that nature. And this is your, your, your picture or your portrait of, mm -hmm. of your new mm -hmm. team member. So Mitch really is, this is the heart and soul of lifestyle recruiting. Talk, yes. to, talk to me. So, um, the last question, I now call that creating your perfect teammate persona. I didn't have that verbiage when I wrote the book. So uh, trademark coming. <laughs> so on our website, recruitgreatpeople.com, people will see tools, et cetera, of how to create your perfect teammate persona. That's an exercise I do with clients mm -hmm. um, and so forth. So I think I want to review questions one through six. Just That's all there are. Man. Let's go. Let's go. Uh, Let's go questions one, two, and five. One, two, and five. So do you really want to tackle the dichotomy component? Yes, I do. Okay. okay. I do today. I'm feeling uh I'm feeling a little uh, feisty today. So let's tackle, let's challenge people's thinking. What do you say, Dr. Let's do Keith it. McNally? Let's, let's do, do it. Let's do it. One, two, and five. Yeah. You want so me to reiterate what, what one was? Yes, please. <laughs> do you know? who you need to hire and then do you know why you need to hire them mm. the powers and the why yeah so here's the process that normally happens when people need to hire first of all they normally are urgent about hiring someone in that moment because most people only hire and recruit when they have an immediate need 
that is a mistake. It's behavior number one for most hiring leaders. It's also a mistake number one. Wait, wait, you no, should re repeat that. What? It, it's behavior number one. That's what you said. Yeah. It's also mistake number one. Okay, that's okay. Here's Talk why. to me about that. You should rarely, you should be so adept at recruiting constantly, ongoing, every day, most moments, that you rarely find yourself in a situation where you're hiring out of desperation or urgency. Hmm. In other words, it should look like this. Um, Keith, I've enjoyed working with you. I am, I found another opportunity, so I'm turning in my two weeks. Your response as an effective recruiter should be, Mitch, we're so proud of you. Great job. Please put me down as a reference. And if you can just help us out these last two weeks, give it your best. Um, we're going to bring someone on board. In fact, I'm going to call them right now. They'll probably start in the next week. And if you can just help us train them to make sure you leave a good impression, that would be awesome. But let's rock and roll. Cool? Wow. Cool. My next I like that is, conversation. <laughs> this whole Rolodex of potential people to work on my team that I've been building for the past year, mm -hmm. I now just pick up the phone. Hey, Mitch was outgoing. He was personable, um, reliable, high aptitude. Here's some things he brought to the table skill-wise. I wonder who I have on my list that would kind of be my new Mitch. How could we replace Mitch? Because he had something that he brought to the table, not just with his skill and talent, but with his personality and energy, that if we have Mitch not at the table any longer, our team is going to be out of balance. Hmm. So I need to find a new Mitch. By the way, if your listeners are really paying attention, I've just given you some insight to how to recruit. Why don't you go ask Mitch? I, yes, I ask Mitch. And number two, identify your best players and build your list based off of your best players. So if Keith leaves me, which I hope he does at some point in time, I have five other Keiths that I can call on who are ready to potentially take an opportunity with me. If mm -hmm. Mitch leaves, and so what you're doing is you're finding that balance on your team culturally with aptitude, with attitude, with personality, and with talent. And now what you're doing is you're recruiting based on your all-star talent. So when your all-star talent leaves, you understand your who and you understand your why. And so the first mistake people make is they wait until they need to hire to actually recruit and hire. Mm -hmm. And the second mistake they make is doing that out of desperation and urgency and not proactively preparing a list that they can call on. Can I ask you a and question? So that's, yes, go. Whenever you talk about that and you, you literally refer to it as a team and it should be referred to as a team, you, you in our conversations in the past said that you've coached sports. Yep. And the application here, I see as being very similar and maybe I'm wrong. Yep. Maybe I'm not, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Cause I never coached sports never, I never run a team. Uh, right. You know, a, a sports team. Um, most of my activities are individual, like running and such. So when I think when I, when you're talking about this, and I'm thinking about my my best players, and you literally said mm -hmm. them as my best players, you know, mm -hmm. and you lose one of your quote unquote your key players. Yeah. Um, how do you go about re recruiting for that in terms of a sports situation? And how, right. what's the simile, the, the similarities between that and an organization? Right. Or maybe, I don't, so am I asking the right question? Because yes, no, in my you're, head, you're right on point. Yeah, in you're my, right my on head, point. it seems to be very similar. It is. The way you're verbalizing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about uh, you're, that? You're, yeah, you're right on point. I, I don't tend to use sports analogies a whole lot because a lot of people don't know about sports, but. I well, love I'm thinking basketball, you know, basketball, I, there's, I love, there's positions. Yes. And if you lose yes. a key position, you're down, yes. like you're hurting. But there's something that prioritizes itself even over positions. And so I love sports analogies. I was an athlete. I still play sports, um, coached it for a long time. 
So I do love those analogies, but, but at its most fundamental state, building a team is building a team. Whether you own the, uh, you know, Denver Nuggets, all uh, uh, NBA basketball team, or right. you own the Dallas Cowboys NFL football team, it, it doesn't, or, or you're a CEO of, of a larger company, you're a department manager, or you're just a, a small business mom and pop shop on the corner of the team at 12. Building a team is building a team, regardless of how much money is at play, regardless of industry, et cetera, et cetera, because building a team is founded on one thing, culture. And so you have to decide, and if you listen to professional sports teams, owners, general managers, coaches, so let's give an example. Uh, the NFL, National Football League, American football is about to kick off. So what you hear over the last couple of months for teams that changed coaches, mm -hmm. what you hear them is, hey, we're bringing in a new culture. We're bringing in a different strategy. We're bringing in a different approach. And one of the first things you see when a new coach comes in is what? They begin changing players. They don't, they don't re-up contracts of some players. They bring in new players. They trade other players. And the biggest reason they're doing that is they either, A, don't fit culturally, or B, they don't fit schematically. And so that's the scheme is where you're talking about positions, skills, talents, and abilities. Mm -hmm. But the first thing that any great leader wants is a cultural fit. In fact, the greatest coaches in sports will talk about, give me great people, and I'll make my system shift to their great talent. And so think about that for a second. A mm. great coach is actually going to say, I normally like this scheme, this approach to the game. But before all of that, I just want great people who are dependable, have high aptitude, have high curiosity. They're ready to learn. They're really to, willing to come to work every day. They put the team first before self. Give me those people. And I'm a good enough coach that I'll change my scheme to fit their talent and ability. So that's directly connected to when I talk about Throw the skills and job descriptions out the window for a second. Before you focus on job descriptions, skills, and talents, you need to find the people that fit your culture. Mm -hmm. If you want a negative culture, don't hire positive people. <laughs> if you want a positive culture, don't hire negative people. I don't care if you think they are the best SEO search engine driven uh, programmer in the history of the world. If they're negative, Nelly, you don't want them because, because if you bring in someone who is opposite your culture, they will eventually bring down everyone else, even if they are a high performer in skill and talent. And so when it comes to recruit, that's why I firmly believe in lifestyle recruiting. I want to see how the person's work ethic is. I want to see how they engage with people, whether it's on social media or in person. I want to see what types of things they support and align with. I want to see what type of viewpoint they have on the world and on other things and people around them. And lifestyle recruiting is so valuable because I can walk into any business or I can get on social media and stock people's content. And I can tell you within five minutes what type of person they are, what type of attitude they have, what type of perspective they have. So I'm, I'm automatically reading their resume without ever telling them that I'm hiring. And so then those people, that all-star talent just goes on my list. And so then what I can do is play the, the puzzle master game and go, okay, do I have a spot on my team for a search engine optimization person? No, I don't, but I'm always adding great people to my team. So do they have another skill that could be applicable for what I need right now? But the, but the job description and the skill and the talent, just like creating a great sports team, do you need different positions? Yes. But do you need bad apples in those positions? No. You never sacrifice that. And here's the thing that people have to realize, just like in sports, there are more amazing people out there than there are amazing talent who are negative people. In other words, you're going to find some of the negative people who are highly talented but if you're lifestyle recruiting and constantly searching and digging for the great people with great aptitude, attitude, uh, you know, uh, curiosity, if you look for those people, the talent will take care of itself. If you put the person before the skill set, 
And that's where people get it so messed up. You look at any job description and 99.9% of them are going to say what? Job requirements, job skills, educational requirements, experience requirements. Very few, if any, job descriptions go, okay, I want to know what kind of attitude you have. It's a bad day. The sun is not shining. It hasn't shown in 10 weeks. You're sick. You're sad. The job, the, uh, the, the job culture is bad. How are you going to come to the table then? That's what I want to know. Forget when it's all sunshine and roses. I want to know when the chaos comes, what type of person are you in that moment? That's the first question on the resume on the application. Not what's your job experience? Who gives a flip what your job experience is? I can teach you 90% of the stuff you need to know. I can buy certifications. I can buy degrees. What I can't buy is attitude, aptitude, awareness, energy, curiosity. I can't buy those things. And so just like in sports, everyone has a role, everyone has a position, not just in functionality, but also energetically, spiritually, and attitude-wise. There's a reason sports teams select team captains. The players vote on those team captains, and oftentimes it's not the most skilled person that becomes the team captain because players aren't stupid. They know the people that come to the table every day. They know the people that have the good attitude. They know the people that help the team rise up. And oftentimes, I've seen it time and time again, it's not even a person that plays often that becomes a team captain. But they're the cheerleader. They're the person that equips their teammates. They help them prepare for the best uh, competition they can possibly prepare for. And you don't have to have all-star talent to be the all-star player. You have to have high energy high vibration, high aptitude, high awareness, and high presence. And if you have those things, everything else works itself out. And again, that's the why and the who. Has nothing to do with job description, has everything to do with job presence. But the problem is many leaders have zero clarity on who they truly need on their team. I was working with a client last week and they brought on a new manager. And so he was like, hey, can you meet with my new manager one-on-one, start pouring into them, helping them get ready? I left the meeting and I was like, look, I support you, but I never would have hired that person ever. Oh. They literally almost fell asleep during our meeting. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on in their life. Maybe there's some issues at play. Maybe I was boring. I don't think I am. <laughs> Maybe they don't care a thing about what I have to say. That's all fine and good. Right. But I just want you to know, as a consultant to a client, I want clarity on, you need to know, I would have never hired that person, not in a million years. Now, if you're going to keep that person, I will work with them. But also, if you're going to keep that person, you need to make sure your next manager is cheerleader, rah, 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 excited, passionate, brings some exuberance through the door. Because what are we looking for? Balance. So if you're going to keep person who fell asleep in a meeting on your management team, then you better balance that with cheerleader, excitement, let's go, rock and roll, bring that energy through the door. Because if you don't find that, ba- and conversely, the other way, if this other person would have been like, Mitch, I'm excited, here we go, I would have told business owner, okay, your next manager needs to be subdued, kind of in the corner, Still a leader, but personality-wise, you need that balance. So my question to business leaders listening to this conversation, when is the last time you've hired based on balance? We talk about alignment all the time, which is priority number one. But for me, priority number two is balance. Balance in personality, balance in presence, balance in gender, balance in ethnicity, balance in culture. When have you looked at your team and gone, oh my gosh, we don't have a representation for someone who's introverted. We have a whole bunch of extroverts. We don't have the balance of introversion. And so it's all of those questions that you have to ask yourself. But I told you, the behavior number one is people lose someone, so they feel the urgency to hire, and then they mis- make mistake number one, which is hiring based out of urgency. Mm-hmm. The conversation should go, Keith, you've done a great job. I support you. Please put me as a recommendation. I'm going to challenge you to replace yourself before you leave. That you're, you know that's our culture. But number two, I'm going to go and make some phone calls and bring some more people in, and I need your help in training them. That's how the conversation should go every single time, unless it's a legality or a disciplinary issue. That's a whole other subject. But hopefully, you're hiring such good people that when they walk out the door, 
you want that person to reciprocate themselves. So question number two follows question number one, but it's about dichotomy or ba or balance. So now you're using the word balance. You yes. use, you're using the word balance. I used the word dichotomy earlier. Skill set or character? Are they mm -hmm. are they a balance? Experience versus work ethic, or is it you know because there's the word or is quite literally on the page. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's skill set or character. Experience, I'll read the question. What? I'll read the question. The question dictates the question reads, what we're which do you currently value more? Yes, like one from each of the choices. Yeah. So, do you want skill set or do you want character? Do you want experience or do you want work ethic? Do you want past job experience or do you want energy? Do you want degrees or do you want creativity? So again, so this the, is the what phrase is, the phrase is value more. The response is, do I want them? Yes, to both. Okay. But the phrase is, which do I value more? And that's again, going back to, am I only valuing? And, I, and I'm asking this question and challenging the thought process of so many. Because oftentimes, now let's remove the 5% of jobs that you need the educational background certification. Let's remove legal, let's remove medical, let's remove, uh, I can't even remove school teachers now because so many educational institutions are now actually creating programs where you can go teach school for two years and get a bachelor's degree as an in-person trainee. So I can, so we can even remove that. You don't even need a, a teacher at, uh, certification we'll in many states <laughs> to go in and teach. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, and so, which I, by the way, I like that program. I'm glad they're doing it. So, but again, why did they do that? They did it based out of urgency because they can't find teachers. If they would have been proactive in this program 20 years ago, they wouldn't have had That's to. another conversation. So it is, but, but it's the principle of the matter. And the principle of the matter is exactly what we're talking about. What do we have set up systematically to be proactively creating opportunities for great people? And that's a prime example at a very high level, obviously a really large scale, mm -hmm. but it's the same principle. And so it goes back to, we could just use, let's just follow that example for a second. Okay. okay. Really? Okay. We'll follow it without getting political or anything. Okay. So the educational institution said all these years, you have to have a, you know, years ago, it was just a bachelor's degree with a teaching certification. What does that mean? You get a bachelor's degree in some form of education, and then you go on and take a test to get your certification. That's what it meant in most states in America. Probably that way most parts of the world would be my guess. Then all of a sudden it moves to, well, now it's not just a bachelor's degree. You have to have a master's degree. So then they, about 15, 20 years ago, introduced the pay scale. Well, if you have a, if you have a master's degree, we're going to pay you $20,000 a year or more, right? And so now all of a sudden it's not only bachelor's degree, but master's degree. So now, now it's about 10 years ago. Well, if you want to be in administration, what do you have to be working towards? Yeah. Usually PhD. Yeah. yeah. So let's just pull that thread a little bit. Do you value education or experience more? Do you value education or presence more? Here's the issue. When, when most conversations around public schools take place, it's usually centered on how poor our public school system is. Let's call that AKA culture. Okay, so why is that? Why is the educational system not great for many people? Why do many kids not get a good experience? Well, let's pull the thread back to our motivation for hiring people. If I walk in the door 25 years ago of an educational institution, and I can teach circles around everyone in that building, but I don't have a bachelor's degree, am I going to get hired? The answer is no. no. Toad on a toadstool teacher who has absolutely no ability, no personality, no energy, only went into teaching because their parents told them they should, but has a master's degree, they're going to get any teaching job they apply for because they are, quote, qualified. qualified. Yeah. And so let's pull the thread even further. Oh, my gosh. Why is our educational culture not where it should be? I don't know. Maybe because of our re uh, requirements that are pushing out great teachers like a guy like Mitch Gray, who may not have their traditional education, 
It's pushing them out of opportunity, by the way, not that I ever wanted to go into the public education system because I did not, but let's just push that further. But so-and-so, Keith McNally has a master's degree. You are a great teacher for this scenario, you're not. And Keith is not a great teacher. Parents keep complaining. We keep pushing them to other schools because one school burns them out. So they move to another one, but we're going to now keep them in because now they're, oh my gosh, they're tenured. And so we can't push them out the door. Okay, let's pull the thread further. Let's move to 2020. When we had a worldwide pandemic, teachers started retiring. Teachers started getting burned out. They started quitting. The migration started taking place. Teachers moving out of the teaching world. In 2021, educational institutions said, my goodness, we can't even meet state requirements of teacher to student ratio because we don't have enough teachers. All of a sudden in 2021, many states introduced a program. Uh, some states are calling it Ed Follows. And what they're doing is in two years, you can be a teacher study in the classroom. You get paid a very good amount of money. In that two years, you have a bachelor's degree and a teaching certification. So you're getting paid to get a degree, you're getting trained on the job, and now you can step into a role. So let's turn the pages back in history a little bit, and I'm going to apply this whole scenario, okay? This is all factual, by the way. What if 40 years ago, people would have said, you know what? We're just going to recruit people who are really good with other people, and we're going to pay them pretty well. And in two years' time in the classroom, they can now have a bachelor's degree and a teaching certification. Oh, and by the way, some of that state funding we get every year, we're actually gonna put that toward, we're gonna get five scholarships for people to go get their master's degree. Every single year, we're gonna do that. We'll get state fund and federal funding for it. We can make that happen. Why not? What if that would have happened 40 years ago? Now all of a sudden you have a culture of people who are being screened because of their personality, presence, and ability to connect versus are they educated? And now all of a sudden you have people that buy into a culture because they've been invested in. And let's take it even further. Are you serious? I, I personally know people who are in this new program to become teachers and they have to sign a five-year contract. Guess what? They don't care because they're getting their education paid for. And so that is a perfect example of A, how not to set up a system and B, potentially how you could set up a system. Oh my gosh, I need a computer programmer. All I know is to hire someone with experience, but what if you just found someone that was really, really good with connecting with other people? They were good at explaining things. They were good at, 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 at creativity and curiosity and asking the right questions. And they had a little bit of a, you know, kind of lean toward, I want to learn more about computers. What if you paid $5,000 for them to go get certified in a great program? Why not? It costs you $4,000 on average to hire a new employee. So why not take that, add another thousand and have them go get their certification and have them sign a four-year contract with your organization? Why not? Like, why are people not doing more of that is my question. Here's the answer. A, they don't understand. So they fear those opportunities. B, they could potentially be lazy. And they tell people like, Mitch, I don't have time. Oh, you have time. You're just choosing to not have time. So I view that as lazy, not in a bad way. It's just the truth. Or C, they don't care. They're actually just in business because they're second or third generation owner. Or they're just in business because they originally cared for what they're doing, but now it's grown and they don't really care if it grows. Any, they don't really care if people are happy. They don't really care if people are fulfilled. They're just hiring employees because they have to have employees. And so then the question becomes, why are you in the position you're in at, at, at that point in time? If you really don't care and you're disconnected, then make a change with yourself and get out of the position. I'll share another quick question that I know we need to wrap, another quick story we need to wrap up. So last week I was actually having a conversation with one of my kids and she's working a job in an environment that owner doesn't care, oh. owner is just second generation, um, shows up every once in a while to fire people, doesn't ever show up to do anything constructive. Uh, my daughter is a leader. I mean, a real leader. At, at 17 years old, she was a manager at a fast food restaurant. I mean, all my kids were that way. They're, they're just leaders. And so my daughter, we're sitting there at uh, dinner and she's on her phone and I'm like, is everything okay? And she's like, uh, work problems. 
And I'm like, okay. So my head, first of all, my 21 year old college student is at dinner with her family dealing with work problems. A, it's because she's about the only responsible one on the team, literally. So she's trying to help figure things out. I said, so what's the problem? She goes, well, evidently one of the managers went on vacation and didn't get her schedule filled by someone else. We won't go there. That's a huge mistake. Don't, well, don't do that. So now she says there's another part-time teammate at the store by herself who's not a manager and doesn't know how to close up the store. And wait, so wait, owner, how old is she? So, so this part-time manager person is another college kid, 19, oh 20 gosh. years old, right? My daughter's 21, you know? And so I'm like, so where's owner? And she's like, oh, owner's in the message as well. And he just said to shut the store down early and that he's going to fire the person who didn't show up for their job. <laughs> okay. Let me back up a little more. Oh my gosh. Person who didn't show up for their job. It's their first day on the job. So they ha technically haven't worked yet. We could go into the legalities of that, which there are some legalities. We won't. Second thing is they decided not to show up for a shift that they got asked to cover, not for their scheduled shift. Uh huh. Third thing is what happens, what's the difference between owner acting that way, which by the way, I see that quite often in the workplace at all levels versus owner who would say, look, Brooklyn, that's my daughter's name. You're on your day off. Please get off the text messages. Anyone else on their day off, this isn't your business right now. I'll catch up tomorrow when you work. I'm going to go in and cover the shift. It's my store. I'm going to go help out. And, you know, we'll figure all this out later. All right. That's the sensible approach. The problem is many, many, many business owners don't take the sensible approach. The sensible approach in the educational system in America 40 years ago would have been to create an in-classroom training program where people could earn their bachelor's degree while training on the job and you wouldn't have a teacher shortage. But just like teacher shortages, many businesses have employee shortages. <laughs> and what I hear them say is, I can't find people, no one wants to work, everyone wants to work remote now, uh, people are lazy, no one shows up. And the question always becomes, okay, you understand this is a reflection on you, correct? This is not a reflection of the employee. This is an reflection of a reflection of a leader. Mm -hmm. And so how and who are we going to bring to the table? What are we valuing before anything else? Are we valuing bringing great people aboard? Are we valuing bringing curious people, bringing excited people? Or are we valuing just sit, sticking to the systems of old? that said, I need a computer program who graduated from MIT with a 3.8 GPA or higher. And if they don't have that, they now don't qualify. Fine. If that's the way you want to roll, good luck. It's rarely going to work out for you. And so, you know, a long-winded answer, but I really want listeners to understand there is a better way of doing this. There's a better way than the way you've been recruiting hiring and developing. And the better way is to continuously be looking for great people, to continuously be creating your Rolodex, to create a great empowering culture. And then when you do find the MIT graduate with a 3.8 or higher, who's amazing, hopefully it works out. But if that's all you're dependent on are the degrees, the certifications and the experience, you're constantly gonna be chasing your tail. It just doesn't work. You're laughing because you probably, you're such a smart guy, I'm sure you went to MIT. Like, I know you have that way high education and it's amazing and you earned your PhD. I just want to be likable, man. I just want to be likable. <laughs> but you know where I'm coming from. You know where I'm, here's the great thing. When you, when, you, when you raise your level of awareness to only bringing great people, most of the time what happens is you begin running into people who are great, but also have great qualifications. That's usually how it works out. People are like, why well, don't have the time resources to train people? I get it. But usually if you raise your awareness, all those people come to the surface. And it's a really cool thing. Yeah. By the way, go order my book, How to Hire and Keep Great People, anywhere you order books. And you can hear more of my rant. And here's the book, How to Hire and Keep Great People. Mitch Gray, thank you so much for talking about Chapter 9. Because lots of stories are involved. 
and we'll see you next time. Take care.